Oh, well, welcome to the Raw Aeronautical Society first Cool Aeronautics webinar. A big thanks to our wonderful program sponsor, AAA Corp. Um, we would have loved to have been with you all today in person, but um, you can still enjoy the wonders of Cool Aeronautics at home. We've got some fabulous people to um, talk to you today and answer your questions. If we can just go on to the next slide. So we're delighted to have some amazing speakers who work in space, aviation and engineering to answer your questions today. Uh, first person is me, um, Joe Fox. I'm from Space Fund. Um, we work with space education. We have Johnny Short. He's away from Johnny. Um, he's a pilot. Um, and working on the STEM Flyer program, which is really exciting. We have Jenny Edwards, systems engineer for Lockheed Martin. She's got some really um, interesting stuff to tell you about working as an engineer. And we have Nicole uh, Kaplan, who is an astrobiologist from the European Space Agency. Um, also connected to this webinar, we have our own Cool Aeronautics Activity Pack. Um, and it's, this is available for you to download from the careers website. We'll tell you all about that later. Okay, I think we're ready to start. So uh, first person I'm going to inter interview is myself. Um, so my, as I said, my name is Jo Fox. I run a education program where I go into mostly primary schools and teach uh, children about space and trying to infuse you and tell you all the interesting and exciting things that are go going on in space at the moment. Uh, I also work for ESRO UK, that's the European Space Education Resource Office. Um, they're based up in York and our job really is to um, run training sessions for teachers so that they can then uh, learn about space and uh, implement space in your lessons. So if you want your teachers to learn more about space, send them to me and um, I hopefully be able to run some sessions for them. Okay, so we're going to answer some questions today that um, you've put forward. We had so many questions, we decided we were going to put them in a random spinner. So we've got different coloured questions and we've got an amazing spinner. Here it is. Um, and I think Nick's going to make it spin and depending on which colour it lands on, I shall answer a question from that colour. There we go. And we have a look at a yellow question. So let's see what that is. Okay, the question is, what fascinates me the most about the world of space? Well, my fascination of space probably started when I was at primary school. I distinctly remember watching the um, shuttle launch in 1981. I was 10 years old. And in those days, we didn't have big screens like you do at school. We, you know, we used to get very excited if we saw the teacher wheeling in a big TV, a big fat TV on wheels. We always knew something exciting was going to happen because this got wheeled in. And we're really lucky we got to watch the uh, shuttle launch. And then from that, I think I was always very interested in space, um, just the size of it. I love looking at the stars and thinking about um, the distances and the sheer size of the universe and how small we were on Earth in comparison. Um, and looking is stargazing. I love looking at the stars and just wondering about their distances and how long the light has taken to get to us. And something I really love doing is watching the International Space Station fly over, which at the moment, if you um, look it up online, you'll be able to see it's actually you know, visible um, from the UK at the moment. So quite late at night, but it's a good excuse to stay up late. Very bright. I definitely recommend having a look at if you can. Um, lastly, I'd say what fascinates me about space is um, just the awe and wonder. I think it's really important that we um, are going out there look, you know, looking for life, looking for um, new and exciting and interesting things. And I know that um, uh, Nicole will be talking a bit about that uh, later as well. Um, so 
and also the environmental movement. I think um, you know that was um, started from the Apollo missions that went to the moon, and um, when they were able to look back at the Earth and see how fragile it is, and because we're able to now um, to look out down down at the Earth and see um, things like glaciers receding and things. I think um, it has an important role as well as an inspirational role. Okay, next question, please. A purple question. What do we have here for that? How do astronauts travel to space? Rockets. Ah, okay, rockets. Fabulous. Now, Rockets, oh, we can all recognise a rocket because they're tall and slim. I've got one behind me here. I'm just going to show you. You can see the top of it up there and the bottom of it probably down there. And this is the Saturn V rocket that took the astronauts to the moon. I've got a little um, astronaut here so just to give you a sense of scale. If I hold in there, you can see how, how tiny an astronaut is in, in comparison. And in fact, if I put my camera back up here, the astronaut would only go in this very, very top bit, the command module, right at the top. The rest of this is pretty much fuel. Um, and you can see a picture on the screen here of this Soyuz rocket that took Tim Peake to the International Space Station. So rockets are, um, are tall and thin because they need to cut through the air to get to space. Um, and um, aeroplanes work uh, on the same principle, um, and I think Jenny will be telling you a bit about that later. Um, so it, it's really important for them to be this shape to get into space, but once they're in space, it doesn't really matter what shape they are. So for example, I've got here my model of the lunar lander that was packed inside the Saturn V rocket. And the lunar lander, you can see, it's not streamlined at all. And that's because in space, there's no air, so we don't have to worry about that. And this was solely built to be as light as possible to land on the moon. And the International Space Station, if you look at that, it's an unusual shape, it's not streamlined, and that was built in space, so it didn't have to be uh, streamlined. Now, it takes uh, eight minutes, I think, to get into space, not very long just have to get up um, into space. But the key is, is to get to um, orbital speed, which is 17 and a half thousand miles per hour. And by be by getting that fast, they're able to travel around the Earth without falling back down again. And then once um, the astronauts are in space, it can take between six um, and 48 hours or whatever to, to meet up with the International Space Station. Because as you can imagine, as uh, you're traveling around in your spaceship at uh, 17,500 miles per hour, and you're trying to meet up with the International Space Station, you don't want to crash into it. So they have to line up very, very carefully. So that's how we get into space at the moment on rockets. Next question. Okay. This is a yellow question again. How do you become an astronaut? Oh, that's an interesting question. Now, there are many paths to becoming uh, an astronaut, um, but the main theme behind it is studying STEM subjects. So that's science, technology, engineering, maths. So if you're at school at the moment, those are the subjects you really need to uh, work hard at if you're thinking maybe uh, that you might quite like to be an astronaut. Now the early astronauts, so those that were uh, the Mercury pilots and the Apollo pilots, and they, sorry, they were all pilots, as I was saying, they were all pilots. And um, because their skills of being able to uh, fly airplanes and helicopters were transferred over to um, space. Nowadays it's slightly different, but we still have astronauts that are pilots. Tim Peake, uh, helicopter pilot for the army, um, on the screen here, we can see um, ESA astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti. She was an Italian Air Force pilot. Um, but once they're on the International Space Station, their main roles are um, sort of technicians for scientists. So being an engineer or scientist, again, really important to be able to do the job. 
in the future, this may change again. Because in the future, we will be hopefully traveling to the moon and long duration flights uh, to Mars that could go on for several months and then landing on Mars and staying there. You could be with the same group of people for two years before you come back again. One of the key things that we're looking at now is people that get on with each other. And I've got a list here of things that might be looking for. So we have thick skinned. Um, so that means, you know, you need to not perhaps get too upset about things. Um, have a long fuse. So again, not get too cross too quickly. Um, easily entertained. So, you know, if you enjoy computer games, I think you could probably, but you know, put up with uh, traveling to Mars quite easily. Because sometimes you don't know, notice the time passing when you're playing computer games. A positive outlook. So, you know, always seeing the bright side of things again is gonna gonna help you um, um but you know in becoming an astronaut probably in the future so yeah that's how you become an astronaut oh yeah there's one more thing i'd like to say there is um working in the space industry is not all about being astronauts you know brilliant job i'd love to be an astronaut but there are so many exciting jobs i love my job as a stem educator and you'll be talking to um a few other people today that will also talk about how much they love their jobs you know we in the future will be looking for artists perhaps to design um you know how the the cities were, are going to look architects to, to design the buildings we'll be looking for filmmakers to you know advertise um going into space perhaps farmers to grow things um and doctors so you know all different jobs um in the space industry more that you'll hear about later Okay, next question. Okay, that's a green question. Let's see what that is. Tell us about the future of space exploration. Okay, so the future, I've touched on a little bit. Um, so the International Space Station that is currently orbiting the Earth 17 and a half thousand miles per hour orbiting the, the Earth every hour and a half has been up, I think, since I think the first part of it went up in 1998, and we've had astronauts on it since the year 2000. Um, but it's getting a bit old, and uh, we are looking to retire it. Um, and Nicole might be able to tell us maybe a bit more about that, but I think it, it's up for review in 2024. But really, we need to start looking at the next step, and we are. We're looking at going to the moon and um, we're looking to build something called the Lunar Gateway. And again, Nicole will tell you more about that uh, later. Um, but the idea is having something similar to the International Space Station, probably a bit smaller, um, orbiting the moon uh, rather than the Earth. So there's that. We're also look looking forward to going to Mars. And one thing scientists are saying is that first person that will be um, landing on Mars, so the first astronaut landing on Mars, is somebody who's at school today. So if you're at school today, it could be you. And um, both going to the moon and Mars really excite me, um, and I'd love to be uh, able to, to travel, hopefully, or well, maybe one day, we'll be able to go there. In the, in the short term, we've got a very exciting time at the moment. Uh, we've got probes going to Mars. And um, yesterday, I think, uh, or even maybe it was this morning, uh, the Chinese uh, launched uh, a probe to Mars. And uh, we're, uh, NASA are uh, launching the Perseverance rover uh, um, in the next few weeks, which will be traveling to Mars. And that's really exciting because uh, two things, I think. One thing is it's going to have the first microphone um, on Mars, so we'll be able to hear what it's like on Mars. Um, and the other thing is we'll have the first helicopter on Mars. It's actually going to be a small drone that's going to fly around Mars. So um, that's, a, that's two exciting things to look out for. Okay, last question. red question how can we discover more about space well the internet's got loads of stuff 
and space, which I imagine a lot of you um, know already. But I would say look at the European Space Agency website. That's our space agency. Um, there's loads of really interesting stuff on there. Also the NASA website. Um, but I would also recommend joining things. So, you know, you could join things like if you're a student, the UK SEDS, they have loads of things going on. Um, also, you could join the Planetary Society, the Mars Society, but get involved in, um, in groups and activities. Um, and um, also, you can have a look on the cool, cool aeronautics part of the website because we'll have some more uh, clips on there. Um, oh, one more thing uh, I should mention. If you are a teacher, then look on the Ezero site. So that's Ezero UK. Um, we have loads of things that you can use in your class classes. And if you're a home educator as well, which many of us are at the moment, then um, have a look on the Ezero website. OK, I think that's all my questions. Let's move on. Well, we're going to show you a video now. It's called So You Want to Be a Pilot. It gives you a clue about who we're going to speak to next. For the aspiring pilot, there are so many opportunities to fly. You could work in the commercial sector or the military, flying anything from passenger planes and helicopters to super fast jets. To qualify for pilot training, you'll need good communication skills and excellent hand-eye coordination and spatial awareness. Once you've passed the medical exam and shown you have good GCSEs, you'll be ready for takeoff. Pilot training can either be integrated, which means you train full-time, or modular, which is part-time and can fit in around other commitments. There are excellent flight training schools to choose from across the UK. And once you've qualified, you could work anywhere in the world. To find out how your career could take off, visit careersinaerospace.com. Fabulous. Okay, so now we're going to have a, a chat with Johnny Short, who's a pilot and involved in the STEM uh, Flyer program. Hi, Johnny. Hi, guys. Thank you for having me on today. You're very welcome. So um, we've got a few questions for you. Again, okay. we had loads of questions, so we're going to um, use the random wheel. So we don't know what's going to come up. Let's have a look. Okay. Right. Let's spin the wheel. Okay. It's Ooh, a blue question. Okay, so Johnny, uh, what is the best part about being a pilot? I think that's probably going to differ for a lot of different people. Um, but for me personally, uh, flying and the thrill of flying is such a freedom. Um, it enables you to do so much more than what you what you would be able to if you were in a car. I think there's a there's quite a famous a famous saying: if you have a mile of road, you can go a mile. But if you have a mile of runway, you can go anywhere. So that that's pretty much hits the nail on the head. It gives you the flexibility to have breakfast in your house in the morning, jump in an aircraft if, if you've got access to it, and you can fly across to say Europe for, for lunch and fly back in time to watch the news at six o'clock. There, there really is, the opportunities are just endless. Um, I, I just like, I love the whole process. You get to see the world from a completely different perspective. Uh, looking down on people, you, you see so many different parts of the country that you wouldn't see when, when you're walking around or when you're driving around. So that, that kind of opens your eyes to, to how beautiful this country is, to be fair. Um, another thing, I guess, is that you're always challenged. No two days are the same, which for somebody like me, and I think for most pilots, it is, is quite an exciting event. Um, although you kind of learn the basics in, in flight school and you read textbooks, it's, it's really only when you, you get the real time flying, when you, when you get to experience what flying's all about. So that's where the passion comes from. And I think once, once you get bitten by that flying bug, that there's no help, you always want to fly. Yeah, it's still on a list of things I want to do. Is to, well, um, come, and, come and see me and we will go flying. Fabulous. OK, next question. It's 
an orange question. Okay. Right. So why is spreading the message of STEM so important to you? Okay, this is this is quite a personal question again. Um, I made it my mission to look at spreading uh, the word of STEM and promoting STEM for, for a few reasons. I was lucky enough to live in the US uh, and in the UK and in Europe, and I've seen how different countries are far surpassing the UK uh, with their, their, their STEM graduates. Uh, the UK has lost its technical edge, really, in this field, um, and employers are having to look at outsourcing to the continent and different countries to fill STEM roles, whereas these roles could be filled if there was a correct kind of pathway and guidance in the UK for, for STEM graduates in the UK. So I really wanted to show people, and my, and my mission kind of came about of, of promoting STEM to show that there are pathways and all the social stigmas that are associated with getting into a role in STEM can be broken down. It doesn't matter what ethnicity you are, what sex you are, what religious background you're from. All of those areas mean nothing if you, if you can have the right guidance to take you through uh, in, in a STEM career, basically. Fabulous. Yeah. OK, next question. Okay, it's a blue question. Okay. What is ah. the STEM Seven Continents Challenge? I think the title might give it away a little bit on this, but we'll, I'll go through it anyway. Okay, so the STEM Fly Seven Continents Challenge is um, uh, an incentive and an initiative that has been set up with myself, um, some other people, the Royal Aeronautical Society, STEM UK, uh, the All Party Parliamentary Group for General Aviation. Uh, and the whole purpose of the flight, um, apart from me flying to all seven continents, is to carry out outreach groups around the world, uh, promoting STEM. Going back to what you said, uh, the varied roles that are available in aerospace, it doesn't have to be a pilot, it doesn't have to be an astronaut, it can be uh, an aeronautical engineer. Uh, which I'm sure Jenny will talk about later. It can be an airport manager. There are so many different fields um, that can kind of be gone into that the Seven Continents Challenge has been created to promote. So my flight will see me traveling to all seven continents. I'll be flying around 38,000 nautical miles, spending over 250 hours in the air. Um, like I said, I'll be carrying out these outreach groups in front of local governments, uh, local education authorities and schools flying clubs, all these sort of people that have an interest in STEM. Uh, they'll be the sort of people that I'll be, I'll be trying to touch, really to encourage future STEMers, uh, so the future graduates who may not have considered going into a role in STEM education before, hopefully we'll be able to offer them an insight into what following a career into STEM could bring. Um, we're going to hopefully touch on parents by showing them that they should be giving their, their kids uh, a bit of a push down the STEM route because of obviously all the opportunities that are available. Um, like I mentioned, we'll be talking to local governments, trying to get them to look at not only curriculums, um, but also different initiatives and incentives available to, to local authorities uh, in regards to help them promote STEM so that we can shorten this gap that we've got at the moment in regards to uh, the need out, out massing the supply basically. That sounds amazing. You're flying by yourself, yes? I'll be flying by myself, yep. I'll be leaving from the UK uh, and then I'll be heading east. So I'll be flying through Europe, then uh, I'll jump across, touch on Africa uh, before I'm back into Europe, and then I fly down through Asia into Australasia through Micronesia. Then I've got a 15 hour open water leg from Hawaii across to the west coast of LA. Uh, which is quite daunting, and then I'll be going down the coast of the states from North to South America down to the tip of Chile, across onto my seventh continent, which will be Antarctica, and then I'll be retracing my route back up through the Americas, up into Canada, across to Iceland, and then back to the UK. So when you say it like that, it sounds quite a lot, and it is quite a lot, and there's, there's a lot of planning that's gone into it. Um, it's a very exciting initiative that I, I really can't wait to get underway. We were obviously supposed to depart this year, but because of COVID, it's been delayed. Um, it's only been delayed, it hasn't been postponed. So that's uh, that's one thing we, we will be doing this flight at some point, hopefully when these restrictions are all lifted. Um, 
yeah, it should take about three and a half months. It's a lot to pack in, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to the challenge. Fabulous. That sounds brilliant. Okay, next question. Let it be an easy one, please. It's an orange question. Orange. Ah, if this didn't come up, I was going to ask you it anyway. Okay, <laughs> okay. Hours on end, all by yourself, on the long routes. Well, I'm quite a sociable person. I like having people around. So being stuck in an airplane for, for, for over 250 hours is, is going to be a massive change for me. Um, like I said, there's been a lot of planning already gone into this flight. But actually, when I'm flying the flight, I'll be very busy as well. I'll be checking instruments and, and navigation equipment to make sure that everything's on point and that I'm heading in the right direction. I'll be doing fuel burn calculations uh, to make sure that obviously I've got enough fuel to get from point A to point B, checking engine instruments to make sure that my engine's okay. Um, there'll be some fun bits, obviously. I'll be looking out the windows, yeah. out the windows yeah. and having this uh, landmarks that might be going underneath my wings. Um, so, yeah, and I'll also be keeping, out the uh, keeping an eye out for bad weather that might crop up in my flight path as well. Okay, and there is one sort of sub question that's involved in this. Um, that it's probably everyone is thinking, how are you going to go to the toilet? <laughs> yeah, this is probably the most common question. People don't want to know what aircraft I'm flying. They don't want to know where I'm going or what I'm doing. They just want to know when you're in an aircraft, a little aircraft, and you're up in the air, how do you go to the toilet? So what I've done is I've actually got, it's a very scientific um, implement that pilots carry around with them. Um, and what we do, we tend to use what is commonly known as, um, as a bottle. <laughs> so we just fill up this bottle, make sure that it's um, put to the side so you don't get thirsty and drink out of that by mistake. Uh, and that is the most technological carrier of toilet water in the world. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, next question. It's a yellow question. Uh, how can a young person follow in your footsteps? Ooh, okay. In well, flying wise, or <laughs> yeah, um, to be honest, I, I think probably one of the the best ways to to get into flying is to go and do a discovery flight. If you've never been in a small plane before, but you've always looked up and thought, oh, that'd be really cool to go in. I recommend going in a discovery flight. Um, when I was learning to fly, we had three or four people um, in, in my flight club uh, and in my training academy who after the first week and after their first or second flight in a small aircraft, getting banged around because of turbulence, didn't like it and they quit. So I would highly recommend before you you kind of think, yeah, I definitely want to be a pilot and, and, and focus all your thoughts on that. I've got for a discovery flight. Also talk to people. Um, if you know a pilot, go and talk to them, ask them how they got into it. Because there are lots of different pathways like the video before showed. Um, and you can either do flying for fun or you can fly for a living. Um, it's really up to you which pathway you want to take. Um, if you're going to fly for fun, get yourself down to one of the local flight schools, talk to some of the local flight school academies, um, talk to pilots that are learning to train, uh, or just go and talk to anybody that's down there with an aircraft and, and they'll basically tell you how badly they got bitten by the flying bug and, and, and try and help you out in, in as many ways as you can. And you may even get taken up on a discovery flight if you, if you ask them nicely. Um, if you want to fly for a career, um, I still recommend going on a discovery flight and, 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 and seeing whether you like flying. Um, there are lots of different pilot training academies in the UK and in Europe and in the US, which is actually where I went to learn how to fly. Um, and they offer different kind of training packages like full time, part time. Uh, they offer zero to hero packages, which is for, for people that have only got minor flight experience under 10 hours. And they'll take you from that 10 hours right up to a part uh, where you can jump in, uh, in an airliner. Uh, so there's lots of commercial pilot training out there. Uh, yeah, and I, I highly recommend it. It's, it's the greatest industry in my opinion, um, and it puts a smile on my face when I fly and when I think about flying. So I hope that helps. Or oh, give me a call. You can always send me an email. Stepfly.com. 
Say that again. I think um, your um, microphone cut out a bit. Oh, did it? Oh, you can always email me as well if you want. If you want to talk to me about how I got into flying, or you have any other questions, Johnny at stemflyer.com. Okay, fabulous. Thanks, Johnny. Okay, um, have we got one more question for you? I think. Oh, oh, so I want to, oh no, I don't want to be an aerospace engineer. I do really, <laughs> but I can't. Okay, thank you, Johnny. That was really you, interesting. Uh, okay, we're going to watch a video now. Uh, about um, so you want to be an aerospace engineer again a little clue to who we might be speaking to next aerospace engineers design everything from planes and helicopters to drones and satellites a big part of the role is designing testing and building parts and systems to solve problems and this century will see revolutionary changes in aircraft design, such as the development of more environmentally friendly aircraft and vehicles for space tourism. To be an aerospace engineer, you'll need to be creative and able to apply your knowledge of maths and science in a practical setting. To qualify, you can either study at university or become an apprentice. The UK boasts one of the biggest aerospace industries in the world. Once qualified, you can take your skills anywhere. To find out how your career could take off, visit careersinaerospace.com. Fabulous. Okay, now we're going to talk to Jenny Edwards, who's a systems engineer for Lockheed Market Martin. Um, hi, Jenny. Hiya, thanks very much for having me on. You're very welcome. So Jenny, um, you've probably seen the formula now, so we're going to ask you some random questions. Um, okay, so let's, let's go to the spinning wheel. And we have a blue question. What is the role of an aerospace engineer and do you enjoy your job? <laughs> Very good question. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one to answer. Aerospace engineering kind of covers a lot of different things. So everything from aircraft to spacecraft and the most things that fly, really. Um, and an engineer is a really interesting role because a lot of people think of engineering as kind of someone with a spanner who goes and fixes things. But engineering is everything from the design, manufacture, testing and even in support service kind of afterwards. Um, so we do everything from kind of working out what fuel an aircraft needs through to making sure a pilot's comfortable in the cockpit and making sure that the aircraft is stable when it lands. Um, and there's lots of different types of engineering that work in the aerospace sector. So engineering is very much a team sport. You'll never get only one type of engineer designing a product, really. Um, so you get everything from safety engineers, structural engineers, software engineers. And myself, I'm a systems engineer. I might be a little bit biased, but I think my job's one of the best. Uh, so I get to look at the big picture. So part of my role is basically looking at how all the little parts will work together. And you've got a little picture there on the screen of what a lot of different people might want to do. So lots of engineering specialists might want to only look at how easy something is to manufacture, for example, or how fast it can go. And systems engineers are kind of responsible for piecing the whole thing together. Another really good part of my job is there's always something new to do. So we do everything from modeling and simulation through to kind of helping the customer, making sure we're not just building the product right, but that we're building the right product. And um, there's lots of creative stuff going on in the industry at the moment. So I love working in space um, and there's always new technologies coming out. So that's another really important and really interesting bit of my role. That's fab. And just notice your T-shirt there. Are you, are you anything to do with, with that? <laughs> so this is the Orion module. Um, it's something that Lockheed uh, Martin is designing over in America. Um, so I'm not involved directly in that one, but we do some similar projects over here in the UK as well. Fabulous. OK, thanks. Right, next question. A green question. Okay, uh, aircraft have to be very strong. So, what are they made of? Oh, interesting. Another really good question. Um, so, a few decades ago, um, aircraft are mainly made out of wood and fabric, but we've moved on quite a lot since then. So, nowadays they're made out of metals, and they can be a few different metals. So, the most common one is aluminium, and that's what your kind of typical passenger jet, like the 747, is made out of. They can be also be made out of steel, but that's quite heavy, um, or titanium. And actually, the, the fastest known aircraft is made of titanium. Um, we're starting to move also towards looking at interesting composites, so carbon fibre and things like that. But they're still fairly new, so they're not as popular at the moment. 
Um, I think a really interesting thing to note is that obviously aircraft's made lots of different parts. So if you even think about when we sit in an aircraft to go on holiday, you're not obviously going to be sitting on metal. Um, so aircraft are made of lots of different bits and also by lots of different companies. So engineering, you'll never really get one big product that's made by one company. So a lot of companies have to work together to make sure the materials all fit together and that they can all kind of be structurally sound together, which is quite an interesting part. Yes. And I presume sort of anything that's going into space um, has to be tested for very high and very low temperatures as well. Absolutely. So space gets um, really hot when we're in the sun because there's not really the same atmosphere as there is on Earth. So we can't have the same shielding and also really cold because when you're in the shadow, you have to provide your own thermal insulation. So there's no real trapped heat. So there's lots of different bits we have to be tested for. We have to test for how strong they are. We have to test how much stress they can go under, how hot and cold they can get and a whole range of other things. Fabulous. That's great. OK, next question. Another red. <laughs> uh, what is the smallest and fastest an aircraft can be at the moment? Uh, OK, so I'm going to ask a question and answer to this question, which is what do we mean by aircraft? So if we're talking about an aircraft as in a typical aircraft some, that someone flies in, the smallest one is about two people tall. Um, so it's, it's just on the screen there. Um, and that, that's quite, you know, quite a little one. But what do we mean by spacecraft? So you've also got the people flying with almost like a wing jetpack on. Does that count as an aircraft? It's propel a propellant. So, you know, maybe that counts as well. Um, we've also obviously got drones that can be tiny enough. So you can get ones that fit in the palm of your hand, even online. And you can also get satellites that are that small. So there are these new satellites called Nanosat and Femtosat, and they can weigh less than 500 grams, but they can do some really interesting jobs in space. As the fastest, well, again, what do we mean by aircraft? Because um, if we're talking about anything that comes through the atmosphere, a re-entry vehicle from space, so when things come back in from a low Earth orbit, for example, they can go tens of, tens of thousands of miles an hour. So they can be really, really fast, and so they have to be protected in that way. Also, if we're talking about aircraft, we mean unmanned aircraft, because there's a NASA plane that can go over 7,000 miles an hour, which is an unmanned one. But the fastest manned aircraft was made by Lockheed Martin, of course, and it's actually held the record since the 1970s. Um, so it was the Lockheed Martin Blackbird plane, and it uh, was 1976 it broke the record, and it was just over 2,000 miles an hour, and that, that was a manned aircraft. Okay, and there's not been anything that's broken that what record since 1976? Not that I know of, not in the same way. So obviously manned aircraft are very different because you have to be able to look after the pilot as well as all the instrumentation. So it's quite difficult to be able to do something that can protect it. So I'm sure, as I'm sure Johnny knows, you uh, you always look after the pilot first and then you look after the rest of the machine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Fabulous. OK, next question. Ooh, I reckon that's a purple question Ooh, just about just about okay do you work with lots of complicated machinery um so i myself i work more on computers so i do a lot of computer modeling and simulation which is really important because obviously it's really expensive to build and test things in reality so part of the benefit of modeling simulation is that you can try lots of different concepts really early on and that helps us work out the best materials to use, the best ways to put them together, and also some of the other key features of, of all these products. Um, but yeah, we do, engineers work with lots of really interesting machinery. So everything from when we're building them, you might have like small 3D printers like you have in your classroom to do small components, all the way through to massive machines called lathes, um, which can help us do things with metals and also big drills. Um, then it comes to testing, we again, we have like lots of interesting machinery for that. So. Wind tunnels are one of the ones we use to look at aerodynamics, which is the way wind flows over things. So that's for cars, but also things like airplane wings and rockets. Um, we've got six off rigs, uh, which is one of the ones just with the car on it there. And what that can do is it can check the vibration and also how the structure is going to behave when we toss it in loads of different ways, upside down, forward, backwards. Uh, and that just makes sure it's structurally sound um, throughout the test so that we can uh, have people in it safely and use it in, in safe ways like that. We've also got, obviously, when we go to space, you have to test a whole different range of things. So you have to use vacuum chambers to make sure it's going to behave right when there's no atmosphere. We have solar simulators to check how the radiation, so how when the sun has its rays coming out onto it, how that's going to act. And as you mentioned earlier, temperature checks, 
because obviously you need all these components to survive for quite a long time up in space. That's fab, thank you. It just made me think actually, because when I was talking about the things going to Mars over the next few weeks and months, I mean, obviously ESA's Rosalind Franklin rover was due to be launching, but unfortunately that was delayed. Um, and that was something to do with the parachute, the landing parachute, I think, and they needed to do further testing on mm. that. Uh, Nicole can, can talk about that a bit, but um, just shows, you know, it's really important, all this testing, um, you know, because when you're spending all this money on these wonderful um, aircraft and spacecraft, um, you need to make sure they're going to work. Absolutely. If a product costs millions of pounds and a test only costs a few thousand pounds, it's better to do the test and spend a little bit longer on it than it is to, to waste the whole, the whole rest of the machine. Yeah. There's a lot of people's blood, sweat and tears that go into these things. Mm. Fabulous. Thank, thank you, Jenny. Um, I'm not sure if we've got one more question or are we I think there was one more, maybe? One more question. Okay, let's go. It's a purple question. Okay, why is engineering so important in aspects of everyday life? It's a great question. It's one I love to answer because as I said earlier, people kind of think of engineering maybe a couple of ways. You might think of a civil engineer that designs your house. You might think of a mechanical engineer that helps design your car. Maybe, maybe, maybe someone that looks after your phone. But there's a whole range of things engineers can do. So everything from robotics to making solar cells to help clean energy through to designing roller coasters um, and lots of other really interesting bits and bobs. So you can work on really small things, nanotechnologies, helping people's mobile phones get quicker and smaller through to massive things like buildings uh, and, and interesting stuff like that. And I think in space in particular, I think people really underestimate how important engineering is. So anytime you make a call with a mobile phone, that's an engineer who's helped you with that. Anytime you check the weather, that's an engineer who's helped you with that. And it goes for a whole range of things. So we also help protect forests by being able to monitor forest fires. Um, we, we help to uh, look into cancer research studies by looking at the way cancer cells grow outside of the body. Um, we also do cool things like helping to stop pirates because you can obviously scan a large area of the sea when you're up in space and you can use interesting types of cameras to check where things are hot on the sea. And then you can help look out for pirates that might be doing some uh, some nasty things that we we can help stop the the coast guards there and send the coast guards out. Wow, all encompassing, brilliant! Thank you so much, Jenny. No worries. Okay, I think um, we're now moving on to our final guest. This is Nicole Kaplan, who is an astrobiologist for ESA. Hello, Nicole. Hi. Thank you so much for inviting me. Very welcome. Okay, so we have some random questions for you, Nicole. Let's move to the spinner. Okay. I think that's an orange question. Let's have a look. Okay, so what is the European Space Agency and what does astrobiology mean? Two questions, really. It's <laughs> two in one. Um, so the European Space Agency, um, also known as ESA, which you can see on my shirt here, uh, provides European participation in space programmes. We're made up of 22 members from all over Europe and Canada, and we come together to work on all sorts of different space projects. Often we work with other agencies, such as NASA in America or Roscosmos in Russia. We make space work for everyone, not just the astronauts flying around in spacecraft, but for you yourselves. And uh, a lot of the technology you use today was actually developed in space. We build and we launch rockets and, technology, and, and satellites. We train astronauts and we watch over the Earth. Uh, we explore space to try and answer some of the bigger questions about the universe. And that leads me on to the second part of this question, which is where astrobiology comes in. Um, astrobiologists seek to answer questions such as where did we come from and that's the origins of life. Also what extreme environments can life exist in so it can fly through space or be on other planets that aren't as comfortable as planet earth and that's where we talk about testing the limits of life. And then there's a very exciting question which you might already be wondering uh, when you look up at the stars at night and that is is there alien life out there? 
And there's this possibility, and it's a real possibility, that life exists elsewhere, not just in the solar system, but beyond in the wider universe. So astrologists would like to look for it, but in order to do that, we need to work out what exactly we're looking for. That's fabulous. Yes, I have a bit of alien life here. Uh, where is it? My little, my little Martian worm oh, here. Yes. <laughs> this, is, this is taken from the, the meteorite near the ALH eight four thousand and one, which is a famous meteorite that that, that was discovered. And saw so a little picture of a, a microbe, but I don't think it's you know. It's still not not sure whether um, it's it's a microbe or just um, you know some sort of anomaly in the uh, in the in the meteorite. But anyway, I'm, next I'm not question. sure where that meteorite comes from. It could be a Martian meteorite, um, and that's a real possibility because we've got evidence that Martian meteorites have actually landed on Earth loads of times before. Yes, yeah, it is a Martian meteorite. Um, it was in the papers many years ago. It was spread across the papers this picture um, of, of the of, uh, of of the microbe, but it's a fossil of the microbe, so. We shall wait and see, yes. but yeah, it's amazing if we can discover life on another planet. Okay, um, Nick, can we go to the next question? The blue question. Matches my shirt. <laughs> yes, it does. Um, why is astrobiology very important within the world of space? And do aliens exist? Coming back to the aliens question again. Um, well, on Earth, we know that there are some types of life that can withstand living in extreme conditions. And when I'm talking about life, I'm not talking about just you or me or even our pets. Um, us humans can actually tolerate very little when it comes to our environment. When it's cold outside, you might want to put on a sweater or a cozy scarf and then when it's a lovely hot day, you might want to wear a T-shirt. It'll help keep, keep you cool. Um, but there are actually some types of life which we call extremophile life. Um, and this can be found in the coldest environments, for example, like the Antarctic ice sheets or inside a boiling hot hydrothermal vent. There's actually a strain of bacteria called strain 121, and it's named that because it can actually survive temperatures of 121 degrees Celsius and reproduce at that level. So it's this type of life that astrobiologists think might be able to survive space. If there are aliens out there, we think that it's most likely that they would be similar to these types of microorganisms that we find in these extreme environments. But of course, we don't know for sure but if aliens existed, what we do know is that we hope they would be very friendly to us and that we would all be able to get along in space. Yes, very much so. I have another another couple of toys to show you quickly, actually, that lead, leads on to this. Do you recognise <laughs> That's what? a tardigrade. <laughs> it's a tardigrade. They're my favourite. Can you tell us a bit about tardigrade? Sorry to... to... That's okay. So tardigrades are amazing because they are found anywhere on Earth where you find liquid water. Now, the special thing about tardigrades is they are very, very resistant, not only to radiation, but also to, um, to drought. So you can actually dry tardigrades down. You can completely remove all of the water from a tardigrade. And it will go into this kind of sleeping or, or dormant state. Um, and then you can, you can put it wherever you like for a number of days, months, weeks, years. And then when you're ready, you can wake it up again. So you can just hydrate it, you rehydrate it by adding water and it comes to life. And then all of its normal metabolic processes, all that it needs to, to live and thrive will, will go back to normal. They're pretty amazing creatures. Yeah, so it sounds like they're very suited to space flight then. <laughs> yes, we've actually sent them to space on one mission before, um, and they did very well apart from when we exposed them to full spectrum solar light. So that's the light that you'll get when you're outside of the Earth's nice protective atmosphere that lets us live and uh, live quite happily. 
um, they don't do very well when you expose them to the full spectrum of solar light. They actually die pretty quickly. So they might not be the best candidate for going out into space without any shielding. Fabulous, thank you for that. Okay, next question. Purple question. Ooh. What other types of experiments are conducted in space and how is this useful to us here on Earth? It's a really good question. There are so many different types of experiments um, that you can do in space um, and some have direct benefit to, to life on Earth. So at ESA, we're working on experiments where we send these extreme far life, so these microorganisms that can survive extreme conditions to space, to see how they react to things such as microgravity. To study how microgravity affects microorganisms, we send them to the International Space Station, which has the European Space Laboratory set up there. And it's in a part of the ISS called the Columbus module. Because we test out the limits of life, there are some practical applications for this too that might be able to help us explore space a bit further. Some experiments look at using bacteria to mine rocks in space. There's an experiment that just came back last year and it's called the Biorock experiment and it seeks to do just this. The bacteria like to eat rocks for their nutrients and they do this special thing when once the rock passes through the microbe, precious metals like copper and gold come out the other end. So essentially they poop copper and gold. Um, but this is interesting because if one day we want to build a base on the moon, then it'll be very expensive and difficult to take all of our building materials with us and not very eco-friendly. So we're performing these experiments to see if we can send these little bacteria to the moon or even to Mars to extract these materials for us. Now, there are many benefits to using bacteria in space, but bacteria aren't always helpful. And an example of this is at the moment, there are some small but significant parts of the ISS that are covered in bacteria. So there are patches um, of the spacecraft walls that actually have what looks like a load of dark kind of mottled mold. And it's actually colonies of bacteria that have just grown on them. So imagine it, you can't just go around cleaning the walls of the space station, water would just float everywhere. And, um, and the best cleaning wipes really aren't a match for some of these really tough bacteria that are sticking to the walls. So there are parts of the ISS that are very grubby indeed um, and not the nicest environment for the astronauts. So one of the latest experiments we've developed is called biofilms and that will uh, launch early next year, I think February or March. And it will carry up some bacteria to see how they grow on different types of metals. We already know that some metals on Earth have antimicrobial properties like copper or brass. Um, and we know that the bacteria doesn't grow very well on it. So we want to know if using copper to build parts of new spacecraft will solve the contamination problem and make future space exploration cleaner and healthier by incorporating those new metals into new spacecraft. Wow. Yes, I love that. I didn't know. That's uh, fabulous. Thank you. OK, next question. It's a yellow question. OK, so how can a young person follow in your footsteps? Well, uh, after my uh, schooling, I went to university and I studied environmental science. So I did a degree in environmental science. Um, the nice thing about that degree that it, it was very broad and I studied things all the way from climate change and ecosystem science to renewable energy and green technologies. Uh, eventually, I specialized in plant biology and I wound up doing a PhD so a doctorate or an advanced degree, um, and I studied how radiation affects plants on Earth. But it was around that time that I was studying, you might have heard of a special mission by Tim Peake, the Principia mission. 
And on that mission, he took with him uh, a bunch of lettuce seeds. And this was called the rocket, expi uh, rocket science experiment because they were seeds of rocket lettuce. And then I started to get interested in short mission called the Principia mission, where British astronaut Tim Peake went up to the space station, but he didn't go alone. He actually took with him a bunch of rocket lettuce seeds. So this project was called the Rocket Science Experiment. Um, and I was really interested about how plants grow and survive in space, particularly with the space radiation. So I asked to get hold of some of these seeds and I ended up doing some experiments on those. And then I kind of became hooked. Uh, I really got bitten by the space bug, if you, if you like to imagine that. Um, and I've always liked space, so I was happy to find out that there was actually a place for plant biologists in the space industry. Um, and the great thing about astrobiology is that it covers such a wide range of fields from biological sciences to physical sciences, um, geography, sociology, and uh, increasingly law. That's fab. I mean, it's amazing that um, the, the uh, Tim Peake rocket project, uh, rocket sea project, inspired you. You know, um, you know the impact of his mission. Um, well, you know the, the huge impact of his mission will probably you know, never not be not just the two million school so children. Yeah, not just that. And I think the the seeds yeah. got sent out to something like ten thousand schools. Um, and I had the uh, pleasure of visiting quite a few of the schools that were taking part in that project. Um, and it, it did reveal some really good results. Yeah, it was found that the, the seeds that had been on the ISS, it was a blind test, so the children didn't know um which which uh, seeds had been on the space station but when they did find out and they gave all of their data to some uh, statisticians uh, they found out that all in all the seeds from space didn't grow as well as the seeds that were kept on earth it's a really yeah. interesting result yeah just just to explain so the project was tim tim took a whole load of seeds up to the international space station and they um, stayed up there for a while and they were sent back down and then all participating schools were, were given a packet of seeds that had been in space, but also a packet that hadn't, but nobody was told which was which, and a blue packet and a red packet. And, um, and then uh, the children had to grow the seeds to, and see if there was any difference in the two. But um, as you said, there was a significant difference in those that went to space. That's fine. And there was a difference. Yeah. yeah. Fabulous. Thank you very much, Nicole. Um, I think that was your last question. There is one more, brilliant. Okay. It's going to be a good one, I can feel it. <laughs> oh, yes. Will we have huh. more stations like the International Space Station in the future? So, maybe one day we'll have another space station as big as the ISS, um, which is actually as large as a football field, so it's pretty big. Um, but for now, the ISS is still going strong. Some upgrades are being made, and there are actually experiments planned all the way to 2030. One exciting thing that ESA are planning to get involved with is the Lunar Gateway. And this will be a smaller sized spacecraft, but it'll still be very important. It'll act as a communications hub and a science lab and a holding area for rovers and robots for missions to the moon. So it'll be held in orbit around the moon. And for human missions, you can think of it sort of as a motorway service station uh, to provide a place to rest and recharge, not just for the humans, so not just for the astronaut crew, um, but for also the spacecraft themselves. Uh, before setting out to do some amazing science on the moon and learning about our closest cosmic neighbour. Now, ESA are heavily involved in, um, in the Orion module, so that's the power and propulsion element. So that's what we're working on um, at the moment, but it's a very, very exciting thing that's coming up in the future. Fabulous. Yeah, and would you like to um, go to it if you had the opportunity? I would love to go to it. Um, so the key difference between 
the ISS and Gateway is that it won't be crewed um, all year round like the ISS is. It's going to only going to have a ability to be crewed for a few months of the year. Um, so it, it's not going to be as uh, as active, but it's going to take longer to get there. So there's yeah. a trade off. Yes. And I presume, you know, the far future idea is that um, we'll, we'll have a station on the moon, which the gateway will yes. be up. Yeah, so it's also important if you're thinking about uh, maybe studying uh, architecture or, or city planning, that we could be using those skills on the moon one day. Yeah, fabulous. Thank you very much, Nicole. Thank That's you. Okay, so we have an activity uh, for you to do at home to make your own paper rockets. I have one here. So it's very simple. You just need an A4 piece of paper and a straw, like I've got here, um, a bit of sellotape. Um, and um, the following video is going to show you how to make that. But we want you to um, sort of become engineers and to make different versions of this. So we've got the normal long version. Then I'd like you to make a short version and then one without the fins. Um, and um, when you test them, see which one travels the furthest, perhaps observe how they fly and see which one you think would be the best. So I'm just going to have a launch of this and then we're going to watch the video.
Well, thank you for watching. Um, be interested to see uh, what you find out with the with the paper rockets. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to all our panelists. So um, a big thank you to Johnny, Mr. Wave. Uh, a big thank you to Jenny, the Wave, and a big thank you to Nicole. It's been really interesting uh, the, today. Um, I've certainly learned a lot. I hope you all have too. Um, you may also be interested in joining our Amy Aviation character for more aviation learning at the link on this page here. And also please um, have a look at our activity um, pack, which is available on the Careers in Aerospace website. Um, I also want to say thank you to um, all our lovely sponsors and supporters here, especially to AAR Corp that have been uh, sponsoring this event today. Um, and also Fun Kids Radio for um, working on the pack. Thank you very much and goodbye. Bye.